Hey guys, and welcome back to another video on my channel. Today's video is going to be another Mystery Monday video. And as you've probably noticed, or actually maybe you haven't, but the background is different, and that is because my mom has finally moved, which means for the rest of the summer, I will finally be able to make videos consistently. So there will be a video every single Monday from now on. And then in September, once I go back home to my regular background, I want to start producing more videos on Mondays and Fridays. So if you have any Friday video suggestions, make sure to comment them down below once you're done watching this video because I really want to start pumping out more videos for you guys. But with that all being said, today's video is a long one, so let's get right into this case. Shannon Gilbert knew at a young age that she wanted to be an actor. But sometime while trying to make money as well as pursuing her dreams, Shannon fell into prostitution. And that is when she began working for a prostitution ring. In 2010, the prostitution ring that Shannon had been working in had somehow fallen apart. And that is when she had to find a new source of income. So her and her previous driver who worked with her in the prostitution ring decided to go into business together. This man's name was Michael Peck and he wasn't just her driver, but he also acted as a bodyguard and if she needed anything during her sessions, he would go and pick them up for her. And the two of them also split her pay. Now, since starting this new prostitution company of her own where she was selling herself out, Shannon started to offer her company through Craigslist. And many people in this industry do do this, but I have to say that this is very, very dangerous. On the night of April 30th, 2010, Shannon and her boyfriend Alex Diaz were having a calm night and the two of them had just gone to the movies. Now I don't really know if Shannon had any intention of working that night or if she had just decided to take the job when the opportunity arose. Shannon usually didn't like to go too far away from her home for work, but on this night in particular, a man by the name of Joseph Buer had just offered her a very large amount of money to provide him with her services. Joseph was newly divorced and known by neighbors to be quite the party animal. He lived in Oak Beach, New York, which was an hour and a half drive from where Shannon lived, but because he offered such a large amount of money, she decided to take the job. So Michael Peck had picked Shannon up and was now driving her to Joseph's house in Oak Beach. And by the time he had actually dropped her off there, I believe it was between 12.30 and 1 a.m. During the time that Shannon was in Joseph's home, phone records show that she had called Michael Peck six times. And one of these calls was to, let's say, pick up some supplies that she wanted for her night with Joseph. But Michael Peck had said no because he didn't know the area well and he didn't know where he could get the items that she had asked for. And that actually checked out because her phone records also showed that she had made one phone call to a CVS in the area near Joseph's house. Now this whole case is extremely odd, but this is where things begin to get really weird. Around 4.30 a.m. on May 4th, 2010, Joseph had come out to Michael's car and he had said that he wanted Shannon to leave but she was refusing and he didn't know what to do so he came to ask for Michael Peck's help. When Michael had entered Joseph's home, Shannon was hiding behind a couch and she was on the phone with the police and she was speaking extremely erratically and saying they were trying to kill her. After Joseph had brought in Michael into the house thinking that he was dealing with this situation, Joseph had went up to his room and didn't have anything to do with Shannon for the rest of the night. Some point after this, Shannon had fled Joseph's house and she was now running through the streets of Oak Beach banging on Joseph's neighbor's doors asking for help. She was actually also still on the phone with the police and this phone call was 23 minutes long. But Shannon couldn't state where she was and was speaking extremely erratically, making it extremely difficult for police to track her down. After Shannon had left Joseph's house, Michael tried to track her down because he thought that this was some weird elaborate plan for her to take his half of the pay. At around 5.22 a.m. after banging on some other man's door, this man, who was a neighbor of Joseph, had brought Shannon into his home and he said that she was absolutely terrified. He could tell that she was really genuinely scared and she was freaking out and she kept repeating over and over again, they are trying to kill me. So this man obviously was scared for Shannon and decided to phone the police, but before he could do so, Shannon had fled his house. When Shannon had gone out the front of this man's house, he had followed her, and when he got outside, he saw a black SUV driving down the road, and we now know that this black SUV was Michael Peck. He said that when Shannon had seen him coming down the road, she ducked behind a boat that he had had parked in his driveway, and after the SUV had passed by, Shannon came out and continued running down the street frantically. The police had said that they allegedly had arrived at the scene 10 minutes after the neighbor had made the phone call to them. But Michael Peck said that he was out looking for Shannon until 6 a.m. and he never saw the police arrive. 
Shannon wasn't reported for two days after this incident had taken place and that was because Alex began to phone Michael and Joseph to ask what had happened and where Shannon was. And that is when they told him exactly what happened in the early hours of the morning on May 1st, 2010. Joseph was extremely helpful with Alex throughout this whole entire time and he even went with Alex to the Suffolk County Sheriff's Department to report the events that had happened the last night that Shannon was seen. The conflicting and confusing part of this is that Joseph had said that the original reason why him and Shannon were arguing was because he thought that she was a man and he didn't want to have sex with her. But if they were not partaking in some kind of sexual act, then what were they doing in Joseph's house for four and a half hours that they were in there? But like in so many cases similar to this one, the police were not helpful at all. The Suffolk County Sheriff's Department actually told Alex that he had to report Shannon missing where she lived in New Jersey, which again was over an hour and a half away from where she vanished. On the same day that Alex had gone into police to report Shannon missing, Mary Gilbert, Shannon's mother, received a very strange phone call from a man by the name of Dr. Peter Hackett. And remember that name because it is going to come up a lot in this case. He told Mary that Shannon was with him two days earlier when he seen her crying and running through the streets. This man said that he gave Shannon a drug to calm her down before letting her leave with her driver, assumably Michael Peck. And he said that he was calling now to see how she was because he was worried about her because she never returned to his house again. And she never phoned him to let him know how she was. Mary had immediately thought this was weird and she asked this man how he got her phone number and he had said that he ran a home for wayward girls and that he required an emergency contact number when they came to his house. Mary has said multiple times that she thought this was extremely strange because she knew that Shannon would have never put her down as an emergency contact number. Another reason why this phone call stood out so much to Mary was that she actually didn't even know at this point that Shannon was missing. This man had also called Alex Diaz the day after he called Mary to ask how the search for Shannon was going. The Gilberts and Alex Diaz had decided to report these phone calls to the New Jersey Police Department, which is the same department where they reported Shannon missing. When interviewed, Dr. Peter Hackett had denied making any of these phone calls. He said that he didn't even know who Shannon Gilbert was until he saw Alex and Mary handing out missing persons flyers in Oak Beach while the search had begun looking for Shannon. But after his phone records were pulled, it showed that he actually did call Mary Gilbert and he had called her actually from his wife's phone and strangely enough, he had driven from Oak Beach to New Jersey to make this phone call. Now I'm just going to give you a little bit of a background on Dr. Peter Hackett because he is quite the character. He was a former practitioner for the Suffolk County Sheriff's Department, but he was fired for lying and using the work phone for things that didn't involve work. He was also believed to have been using his license to prescribe drugs to people that weren't coming to see him as a doctor. Some of his neighbors referred to him as playing doctor out of his home. So he would have people come into his house, he would prescribe them drugs that they most likely didn't need, and then they would be able to go and check these false prescriptions at, you know, a drugstore. At the time of Shannon's disappearance, Dr. Peter Hackett was in his 50s and he had a wife and children of his own. He had never run a halfway house for wayward girls, and he never took in troubled girls in his whole entire life. So that was just a complete blatant lie. And he also had an extremely bad reputation with the people that he knew for being a serial exaggerator. Nobody is quite sure how Peter Hackett had actually obtained Mary's cell phone number. Shannon wasn't even reported missing until that day, and Mary's cell phone number wasn't released to the public for over a month. That means that Peter had just inserted himself in a case where he didn't have any connection to anybody involved and he shouldn't have even known that this girl was missing. And now I'm going to talk about the odd police involvement in this case. Like I said before, Joseph and Alex had gone to the Suffolk County Sheriff's Department to report Shannon missing and they were told that they had actually had to report Shannon missing in New Jersey where she lived. This is a huge part of why Shannon's case took so long to close. The two police departments had never started looking for Shannon until a month after she had gone missing. And when they did finally start to look for her, the two departments weren't even working together to find out what had happened to this girl. They didn't even connect the frantic phone calls of the girl running through the street in Oak Beach screaming for help with Shannon's disappearance until months later. And by the time that they had connected the two, it had been so long that when they went to interview the residents of this area, they didn't uncover any new information. On December 10th, 2010, a police officer was out with his canine when they were doing a training course, and that is when the dog discovered the remains of a woman. This woman was nude and wrapped in a burlap sack, 
And so this man immediately called backup and when they arrived and began to search the area for clues or evidence of what had happened to this woman, they uncovered three more bodies in the same state. Megan Waterman, a 22-year-old mother from South Portland, Maine, was the first to be identified amongst these women. She was an escort who was staying in a hotel in New York when she vanished. She was last seen on June 6, 2010, leaving her apartment to go meet a client that she had met on Craigslist. Marie Bernard Barnes was 25 years old. She was a single mother visiting New York from Norwich, Connecticut, and also worked online as a prostitute. She, unfortunately, was identified as one of these victims. Amberlynn Costello was 27 years old and lived just 10 minutes from Gilgo Beach. She was last seen on September 2, 2010, going to meet a client who offered her $1,500 for her services. And the last body that was identified in these remains was Melissa Bartholomew. She was 24 years old from Erie County, New York. Authorities refused to look for Melissa even after her family had reported her missing till days later when Melissa's sister started receiving vile phone calls from Melissa's cell phone. Police had determined that the caller was a man between the ages of 20 to 40 years old. He was Caucasian and by the way that he spoke on the phone, he sounded extremely intelligent and he had a very calm demeanor. He had harassed Amanda by calling her sister extremely awful names and saying that he had killed her. He also told Amanda that he knew where she lived and he could kill her too. Police were able to track the phone call to Manhattan, but the area in which the phone call was made from was way too overpopulated, making it impossible for the police to determine exactly who had made the phone call. Because of the caller's knowledge on how to allow himself not to be tracked by investigators, it led police to believe that this man was either a member of or a former member of law enforcement. But all of these women whose remains were found at Gilgo Beach had brought to the attention that Shannon's case was not an isolated incident and investigators were now dealing with a serial killer. Investigators on the case also believed that the man who was phoning Amanda was actually the killer of all of these women, including possibly Shannon. But unfortunately, that man remained unidentified and has never been caught. In March and April of 2011, another search was conducted in hopes of finding Shannon Gilbert. The search was extended to Nassau County, and while searching there for Shannon, they had come across six more remains. Unlike the first remains that were found, these remains were only partial, leaving investigators to believe that these women were dismembered. One set of these remains was actually matched up to a set of severed legs that had washed up on Fire Island Beach in 1996. But unfortunately, this woman's identity remains unknown. Another set of remains that were found amongst this woman's remains was that of an Asian man. And at the time of his death, he was actually dressed as a woman, and police believed that he was also an escort and that the killer mistaken him for a woman. Jessica Taylor was last seen in Manhattan near a bus terminal in July of 2003. Her torso and legs had been found three weeks after her disappearance, but the body was missing and her skull and hands and tattoo that had been carved off of her hip, all which were found at the dumping grounds and DNA confirmed that they belonged to her. About 200 miles away from Jessica's remains, a female body was found in between the ages of 18 to 24 months old. She was wrapped in a blanket and the body couldn't be identified and has taken on the name Baby Doe. She was later linked to a woman dubbed Peaches because of a tattoo she had of a heart with a peach in the middle that was found on her torso. Her body was discovered in 1997 at Hampstead Lake State Park. After discovering these new remains, police believed that they could have had two serial killers on their hands with similar MOs who wanted to dump bodies in similar places, but it is now believed that one person is responsible for all of these murders. This serial killer has now taken on the name the Long Island Beach Serial Killer. He has also been referred to as the Gilgo Beach Serial Killer, Lisk, L-I-S-K, the Seashore Killer, and the Craigslist Reaper. This killer is believed to have had 10 to 16 victims, and the span of his crimes ranged from anywhere from 1996 to 2010 or possibly 2013. And every single one of his victims was an escort. Shannon Gilbert's body had finally been discovered in December of 2011. Strangely enough, her body was discovered very close to Dr. Peter Hackett's home. But this was also near Joseph Buer's home. So it isn't that deeming of evidence, since that is the area where she was last seen. The Suffolk County Sheriff's Department took four days to perform an autopsy, and almost immediately reported that Shannon's death was from accidental drowning. Shannon's family, along with myself and many other people, believe that this is false and that Shannon was actually murdered. 
Her family was understandably enraged about what the police had said, and so they hired their own private investigator who hired their own coroner, and he had performed an autopsy for a second opinion. The autopsy showed signs of homicidal strangulation due to a fractured bone in Shannon's neck. And this fracture also lined up with other victims who had been murdered by being strangled. Now this is going to bring me to the suspects in this case. And the first suspect that I'm going to talk about is one that you guys have probably been thinking about throughout this whole entire video since I started referring to people throughout this case, and that is Dr. Peter Hackett. Mary Gilbert thought that Dr. Peter Hackett knew more about Shannon's disappearance than he was leading on, and that he was somehow involved in her murder. And I totally think that's understandable. He completely inserted himself in a case that he should have actually known absolutely nothing about. And I know a lot of people get off on inserting themselves in murder cases, but this one is just very odd because this wasn't even made public. He should have had no idea that Shannon was even missing. All of the Long Island serial killer victims were actually found quite near to Peter Hackett's home. He again knew a lot of things about this case before they were made public and he had actually been seen with Shannon on the day that she had disappeared. Neighbors had come out and said that they had actually seen him with Shannon the day that she vanished. So that puts him right at the scene. He was also caught lying throughout this case multiple times to investigators, which just adds to him looking shady. In 2012, Mary Gilbert and her attorney had filed for a wrongful death lawsuit against Dr. Peter Hackett. But he was never charged and isn't considered a suspect and has since moved to Florida to live out the rest of his life. Some people also believe that Joseph Buer could have been responsible for Shannon's murder, as he would have been the last person that Shannon was with before she seemingly had a psychotic break. He was extremely helpful to Alex Diaz after he had found out that Shannon was missing. But on the night that she had gone missing, after Michael Peck had gone out to search for her, did Joseph do the same? And my biggest question here is what set Shannon off to have her what seemingly was a psychotic break? And if she wasn't having a psychotic break, who did she think was killing her? It seemed that she thought Joseph and Michael were trying to kill her, but I really have no idea. There's no other information on Shannon's mental health before this incident, and there obviously isn't any after, so I'm really not sure about what was going on in her brain that day. But police do not consider Joseph a suspect and they say that there is no evidence pointing to him having any involvement in Shannon's murder or the other LISK victims. This next suspect that I'm going to talk about is one that I personally don't think is a likely suspect, but some people strongly believe that he could have been involved in these murders, so I thought that he was worth a mention. This man's name is James Bissett and I hope that I'm pronouncing his last name correctly. He was a local businessman in Oak Beach and actually committed suicide two days after Shannon's remains were discovered. Now, as far as I know, the main reason that he is considered a suspect by many people is because after he'd passed away, it had come out that he actually owned a nursery. And that being said, that means he had a lot of access to burlap sacks, which all of the LISK victims were discovered in. But obviously, that is not enough information to accuse somebody of murder, and he is not considered a suspect. John Bitroff was a resident of Suffolk County and was convicted of killing two prostitutes in 1993 and 1994. He is suspected of killing a third, and there were similarities between his murders as well as the Long Island Beach killings. He was also a strong suspect in at least one of the Gilgo Beach murders. He was a carpenter and allegedly lived very close to where Jessica Taylor as well as the Jane and John Doe's remains were found. It is also reported that by his neighbors had come forward and said that when he was younger he really enjoyed mutilating small animals. And if you're into this kind of stuff then you already probably know that that is the sign of a serial killer. He also really enjoyed hunting and allegedly somebody who he was hunting with said that one time while they were hunting he got so caught up in the moment after killing a deer he sat down and cut out the deer's heart and ate it right there raw in the forest. And one of this man's victims was actually Melissa Bartholomew's best friend so that kind of already puts him in the case. And Melissa Bartholomew's mother said that she received a lot of phone calls previous to her death from Masonville which is actually where this man lived. But besides all that, they really haven't been able to connect him to this case, and there is no hardcore evidence suggesting that he is the Long Island Beach serial killer. And the last suspect who I'm going to talk about in this case is James Burke. James Burke was actually an investigator on the Suffolk County Sheriff's Department and was highly involved in Shannon's case as well as the other cases of the 10 girls 
whose remains were found. One year after Shannon's disappearance, James Burke was actually promoted to Chief of Police. And that is when an escort came forward saying that she had encountered James Burke at a house party in Oak Beach. She said that this officer partook in drug use as well as high alcohol use and he had her perform sexual acts on her while he pretty much verbally abused her and called her extremely vile name. In November of 2014, James Burke had to actually step down from his role as chief of police because he was being incarcerated. He was being incarcerated for attacking a man and violently, violently assaulting him after he had attempted to steal sex toys from James Burke's truck. It is also said that James Burke denied the FBI's help in the 11 cases of these girls who have been murdered, along with Shannon Gilbert, suggesting that maybe he didn't want them looking too closely at a case that still remains unsolved. Shannon Gilbert's case is believed to have been connected to all of the other Long Island Beach murders, and her case had such a huge impact on the Long Island Beach serial killer case because without her, it is very likely that none of these serial killers would have been brought together and connected. My heart sincerely goes out to Shannon Gilbert's family as well as the families of the other victims in this case. And I sincerely hope that with new technology, somehow these cases can be solved and whoever is responsible for all of these deaths can be brought to justice. Hey guys, that brings us to the end of this video. If you're wondering why I look different and the background looks different and everything just kind of looks a little bit different, it is because it is a completely different day now. For some reason my camera deleted my intro or at least half of it, so I had to film a new one, so it's a completely different day. But anyways, thank you so much for watching this video. If you liked it, please give it a big thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe and turn on that notification bell so that you don't miss any of my future videos. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys!